I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about what is happening with CDC and what CDC should focus on in the future, we have with us Dr. Steve Morrison, Senior Vice President of CSIS. He is the Director of the Global Health Policy Center at CSIS. And also my co-host on the Coronavirus Crisis Update, not to mention a great friend. Steve, welcome. It's great to have you here today, as always. Your new report, titled Building the CDC the Country Needs, focuses on the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's decline in popular trust and confidence and how the organization can return to the prestige it once had. But before we get into all that, first, can you give us a little bit of background information on CDC? When was it founded and what was the purpose behind it? Thank you. It's great to be with you again and with Liz Pulver, who's helping us pull this all together as our producer. CDC was founded in 1946. It had a slightly different name at that time. Why was it in the South? Why was it in Atlanta? It was because it was charged with trying to correct malaria problems in the South, particularly as they impacted on the training of U.S. military forces. So it had to do with national security. It had to do with trying to rid the South of malaria so that in particular training of U.S. military, which was concentrated in the South, we say. So it had those, that origin, and it stayed in, in Atlanta over the years. And of course, its mission has, has expanded in, in dramatically over the years. There's 20,000 employees. It's an enormous part of the economy and the political life of Atlanta. It's a, it's a big asset for the state of Georgia. And it does lots of different things. Now, our report, which we just published on the 12th of January, treats the pandemic preparedness and response portion of what CDC does. And that's because of the pandemic. But CDC does lots of other things that have to do with other longstanding chronic conditions, environmental factors, workforce issues, and chronic conditions that are very important to the health of the American public. Over time, CDC came to be regarded, to get to your question of how do people understand and know it, CDC came to be regarded as the nation's public health lead institution at the federal level. Right. So not NIH, CDC. Public health. Right. Its mission is to protect America's health. NIH is research and development of creation of new discoveries and products. CDC exists to support 3,000 state and local public health authorities that exist at the state level, at the tribal level, at the local level, at the territorial level, Guam, Puerto Rico, Solomon Islands. And so that's, that's core to its mission is to be able to provide technical support, to be able to provide data, to be able to provide the best science that can possibly be delivered to and shared to inform the work across our nation of those agencies that are there to protect America's health against dangerous outbreaks of a variety of kinds. And that is what we're focused on here is really the, the mission of Uh, preparing for and responding to dangerous pathogens as they emerge, the most notable being the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now we're entering the fourth year of that effort. So, Steve, the report's called Building the CDC the Country Needs. What are the major findings of this report, and how did this report come into being? There's a whole commission behind it. Can you explain a little bit about the structure of the commission, who's on the commission, and and how this report came into being, and, and of course, the major findings of it? Okay. So CSIS has had a commission since April of 2018 on strengthening America's health security. We've been looking at the weaknesses in our system. We've worked closely with CDC over many years in all sorts of different ways. And that commission has many different working groups over its four and a half years, 
we're just closing it now and we're moving to a successor institution, which is called the CSIS Bipartisan Alliance for Global Health Security, which will carry forward work on the pandemic response, but add in other things. It'll be looking at HIV AIDS, be looking at antimicrobial resistance and, and other issues. So it's broadening the scope and bringing a number of things together, the new alliance. But the commission met June 14th, and we've got a number of members of Congress. We have 17 very prominent, very diverse opinion leaders from industry, foundations, public health, diplomacy, and the like. And, and at that time, the sense was that CDC faced a really serious problem. It's standing with the American people had declined precipitously. Uh, because of COVID. In the face of COVID, in the face of a number of stumbles that had happened, we had seen particularly sharp drop over 50% among Republicans. But we'd seen a drop less pronounced among others, among Democrats, but also among key communities, Black, Hispanic, Native American, so it's not just Republicans. No, no. This, this is, is a broad range of Americans in different categories yes, who right. really have seen their, their trust in CDC has declined. What we saw was from multiple levels and multiple sectors, there was this groundswell of dissatisfaction with CDC's performance, and we can talk specifically about that, and a decline in trust and confidence. Trust and confidence is the coin of the realm. It's what public health authorities rely upon in getting people to understand and accept their support. Now, we try in this report to unpack many of the more nuanced aspects of this, right? There's been a very strong surge of anti-science and anti-public health authority in America and elsewhere in the world. The pandemic accelerated and aggravated that. CDC is not alone. We see similar problems with NIH, with FDA, with different parts of health and human services. So, and at the local and state level. A lot of this is fueled by conspiracy theories, disinformation, misinformation, all the above, correct? Certainly that is a factor in the sense that CDC stumbled very badly in a couple of different ways. The testing debacle in early 2020 at the very front end of the pandemic stuck in people's minds. It's never really been fully acknowledged and discussed in depth. But there's there's been other episodes where there have been stumbles and poor communication around guidance on key things, school reopening, masking, and the like. Uh, yes, science changes. There's, there's some, many instances in which those criticisms are unfair or imbalanced or should have been directed elsewhere. But in many cases, they really came to the door of CDC. You can say, yes, the disinformation, misinformation, conspiracy thinking made things worse. But what about the polarization politically surrounding CDC? This has not helped matters because the polarization means that we have the politicization of almost every intervention that has been attempted, whether you're talking about testing, contact tracing, wearing of masks, staying away from congregate settings when there's a rise in, in the virus and the like. And so that compounds the problem. Let me just walk through a little bit more about our approach to this problem. Back to the commission. The commission decided in June, let's take this issue on. We began with there is a serious problem. That serious problem is a, is a decline in performance quality, in scientific ex excellence, in delivery of service, stumbles repeatedly at key moments, the pandemic has overwhelmed it at key moments and aggravated many of its structural weaknesses. And so performance has declined and, and trust and confidence has declined. And this could get worse. It's, the criticism is coming from multiple directions. We see a shift in power in Congress. We see the pandemic itself not letting up necessarily. It's not gone away. Four to 500 people dying a day. Uh, we still have the danger of new variants we know that this is still with us. So it's not going to get better. It could get much worse. America, what we started with was CDC provides a very essential function for the protection of Americans. We need a CDC. We need a high performing and trusted agency that will protect Americans of all stripes. We cannot afford to live with one that is damaged 
not trusted and in decline. If we don't fix this, there's a risk of further stigmatization, marginalization, weakening and depletion of the institution. And none of that is in the U.S. national interest. It's a matter of national security. It's not good news if we wish to protect all Americans. Americans need and deserve a high-performing CDC. What we chose to do was try to come up with a game plan for a rapid reset of CDC. And what I mean by that is from the end of August, August 30th, until the end of this calendar year, we had four meetings. of. We put together a working group, a large working group, very prominent in a number of former CDC directors, FDA director, a whole array of very bipartisan people from Republican and Democratic walks. And, and that was all very conscious that we needed to have bipartisan solutions, solutions that were grounded in very concrete detail that could attract attention. In the past, CDC has enjoyed exceptionally high support on a bipartisan basis, over 90%. It's been seen as a, as a, as a national jewel. That situation has changed. How do we get back to that point? We get back to that point by talking about the very concrete things that are going to revitalize it and attract support from multiple directions. So we focused on a few key things. Data. We can talk more about that. Budgets. Communications and guidance. The global mission, which oftentimes gets overlooked. Partnerships. And we talk about partnerships. We mean the way in which the federal government through CDC serves the interests of state, local, territorial, and tribal authorities, public health authorities, but also the way in which it works with the private sector and the way in which it works within our larger federal government. It's in Atlanta. It's not in Washington. It tends to not be very strong and respected presence here in Washington, in the interagency, in the halls of power, and in its relationship with Congress and the way that it engages Congress. It needs, it needs to be much more aggressive in changing that part of things. So we focused on those dimensions. This was not meant to be encyclopedic. It's really about the pandemic preparedness and response. And we're trying to come forward with very concrete proposals that will trigger a reset and draw support across the board. And it has to be bipartisan. We listened very carefully. We went out and talked to all sorts of people privately. I co-chaired this with Tom Inglesby, a wonderful person, directs the Center for Global Health Security at Johns Hopkins University. He was amazing to, to partner with. Michaela Simonot on our staff also did an amazing job of pulling all of the pieces together. And we put a working group together, as you'll see in the document, 36 other folks of remarkable diversity and achievement. And we knew that this was not going to be easy. As you say, CDC exists in a political ecosystem that is highly charged right now. We've got the Republicans coming into control of the House, investigations going to start, including of the COVID response. That poses all sorts of new complexities. So we are in an era of investigations, and Congress, as you say, is going to investigate COVID response. What are the recommendations in this report that you believe will help mitigate these investigations and will help CDC really stand up and get back to its stellar reputation going forward? Well, I would hope that this appeals to people with common sense across the political divide about what we need to protect all Americans, right? Because everyone elected to, to Congress represents constituents of Americans and in, within their constituencies are public health authorities that struggle to try and protect their populations with support from CDC. So it's hard to paint CDC as sort of the enemy of the people. And so that's my hope. Now, we have said that performance needs to improve, and we've identified some of those critical elements that we can talk about in terms of what has to change in order to bring about that. Some of the changes we're proposing, some of the structural changes are ones that may be difficult to swallow among conservative Republicans in Congress. Like, there needs to be much easier way of getting access to data quick and in an early phase so that CDC can turn that around and be able to advise from a reliable standpoint what is happening on the ground as transmission is unfolding. If you don't have access, if you're spending all your time trying to negotiate late in the day for access state by state, you can imagine what a 
what a setback that is. And that's how CDC has been operating. And so that piece needs to change, but it's very sensitive because it's become politicized. People have privacy concerns. We need governors and state public health authorities coming forward and saying, we really do want to try and find a way forward in negotiated access, bi-directional access around data. We need to find a way forward. Yes. On budgets. But that's that's going to be tough. That's going to be tough. Data is a very much at the core of this. Budgets. CDC's budget is divided into several years back, six years ago, it's divided into 13 categories within 100, within 160 sub earmark lines, 160, with very rigid provisions around not being able to transfer. So as you can imagine, as a crisis emerges and you need surge, you need to deploy staff, you need to have cash ready to do things, you need to deploy into the field. There's very little flexibility in that. So they need, not only do they need to be able to get to the data, they need to be able to have the flexibility to surge at the earliest possible moment and not have to go beg and wait until things start to flow in that regard. Your question around what is going to bring people back to trust, have higher trust and confidence, a couple of things. One is people that are maybe deeply skeptical of the value of CDC. One thing is performance. If their performance improves in a visible way, then people begin to begin to relax and say, oh, I see that now. I see that they're bringing a gold standard science to the table. I see they're delivering things that benefit my state and my local communities. I have people saying, you know, these folks came and they helped us get through this crisis in a very real way. So performance, communicating the returns of the performance, that's one thing. Another thing is the themes that are out there right now are transparency, accountability, and equity are terribly important concerns. People want to be able to know that there's greater accountability to the leadership. The leadership has to be seen as not remote and detached, and they can bring about greater transparency and accountability by doing certain things, like as they prepare guidance on things that are very sensitive, that have huge implications for our economy, getting our children into school, being able to go to work. All of these measures, when you have a dangerous pathogen, it tears up your society in so many different ways. When you make proposed guidance, you have to be taking these multiple societal considerations into your formulation, but you also need to be consulting. They could do much more early consultation with the diversity of Americans about this is where we're looking, this is where we're leaning, not to slow down the delivery of guidance because the guidance has to come out fast. One of the things they've been criticized, CDC has been criticized for is releasing guidance that is too slow, too late, and not easily intelligible to the average citizen, right. spoken mostly, directed mostly at experts versus the American people. It has to be a different language. And so your report recommends they change their communications tactics. We change the communications. We consult earlier. The CDC consult, create buy-in with the communities around the preparation of the guidance, be communicating it, have greater accountability and greater transparency in the way we go about our work and show greater sensitivity to equity. That, And by equity, I mean, there are many communities that feel that they their interests were undervalued or ignored. And we know that's true with Black, Hispanic, Native American communities. But we know also that there's a sense of grievance and bias in other communities in America, in rural communities and elsewhere that feel like they are left out of the equation or come late in the queue with less prioritization. So equity needs to be a much a much stronger impulse. But Steve, at the heart of all this, and we, we talk about this a lot on our podcast, Coronavirus Crisis Update, is the communications of CDC have been woefully inadequate. And I'm not an expert in global health as you are, but I kind of play one on TV and in podcasts, of course. I don't currently know what the CDC guidance is about COVID in our country. I don't know whether I'm supposed to get another booster shot or not. And I'm somebody who pays a lot of attention to this stuff, and I 
texted my doctor the other day saying, hey, my last vaccination was last spring. Do I need to do something else now? Isn't CDC supposed to be really communicating this stuff to us? Yes. And our argument throughout this report is that for CDC to perform at the level needed to protect Americans, it needs higher competencies stronger competencies in several areas. One of them is communications. We're in an age where, as we all know, there's pervasive disinformation, misinformation, and conspiracy thinking. That's been weaponized. That's been weaponized. We know that the old style of communication, of findings and guidance and the like, are outdated, that there needs to be a bit of a revolution in the way that communications are delivered. And so th there needs to be much stronger competencies and investment in creating those competencies. It's going to be difficult to make those changes, but those are essential. Secondly is the ability to be competitive, competent, influential within the executive interagency process. And that requires having senior people in Washington, D.C., representing the agency with gravitas and authority all the time. So if you're not going to relocate the agency to Washington, D.C., which seems like a remote possibility, it needs a much more solid and day-to-day -day presence communicating its perspective in the halls of power, right? Well, at the same time that its public-facing arm is communicating its purpose, its perspective in a way that connects to Americans of all style in a new and different way. The third competence is a communications competence, which is the way outreach is conducted to Congress. There needs to be much more intensified and routine contact and consultations between the leadership of CDC and the full range of members of Congress who matter on all of these issues. There's just woefully too little. If we just rely upon hearings that become highly contested and aggravated, it has to be communication in quiet. Yeah, I was going to say, if you're, if you're relying on hearings, you're way too late to the game because you get to the hearing and the hearing is theater half the time. You're not really being effective in how you're reaching out to members of Congress who talk to their constituents. Right. There has to be a record of or an expectation that on those key committees, that have jurisdiction, that the leadership is having a coffee or a meal or a visit, face-to-face -face visit, on a very regular and routine basis so that the trust and confidence that the bi-directional communication is alive and well with Republicans and Democrats, yeah, with I mean, House and Senate members. And that is that has been beyond the capacity of the CDC up to this point. It's totally doable. I don't think there's a lack of desire to do any of the things we're talking about. It takes a plan and it takes a consensus, which gets me to one of the other major conclusions of this study, which is how to bring about a big change of the kind we're talking about. Well, on the one hand, the CDC leadership has to own this problem. It has to be much more forthcoming in admitting the stumbles, those, prob those mistakes that it owns. It, it can get those out. And Director Dr. Walensky has said, has admitted mistakes and shown candor and self reflection, self criticism publicly, and earned some credit for that. And she's shown, shown that that can buy you time and goodwill. More of that could be very, very helpful. Carrying forward internal reforms in a really serious way. They're embarked on something called moving forward. We outline in the report the four or five major dimensions of what they seek to do, those should be executed and carried forward in a very serious fashion. I can tell, talk in more detail of that. Having said that, most of the power to reset CDC's future rests outside of CDC. It rests at the White House, it rests at the Secretary of HHS, who has lots of authority over CDC, and it rests in the Senate and the House among senior Democrats and Republicans who are in the key positions to strike. So what we are suggesting is 
CDC's entered a moment not unlike the moment that NASA faced in the 86 when the Challenger crashed. Mm -hmm. And people said, wait a second, that's a moment, that's a moment of failure and a moment of catastrophe and a moment where we need to really pause and rethink and reinvent this institution. It's not unlike FEMA in 2005 after the Katrina debacle. In those two instances, the White House, congressional leadership, the agency leadership, other cabinet officers rallied together in order to come around a plan, a multi-year plan for raising accountability and transparency and reinvention of the institution and carrying it forward to a successful conclusion. We're saying that's what's needed in this instance, that this institution, the power to reset it is outside of it to a significant degree. The internal leadership needs to do far more and be fast and bold and not be hesitant and not do half measures. And let's hope that is how we how we see things unfold. But we're really appealing to the White House, to Republicans and Democrats within Congress, to the Secretary of HHS, to see this problem for what it is and to launch a concerted effort, a dialogue that will focus in the way that, that, that was done to resurrect NASA and to resurrect FEMA. You know, our late colleague, Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, often said and was famous for saying, Americans don't know anything about history and Americans don't know anything about geography. In the case of this, you're saying we really need to look to our recent history, Katrina, NASA, the Challenger, to look for a blueprint and how to fix CDC. That's encouraging. How have these recommendations been received? You and the people in the commission have lots of relationships uh, at all levels of government, including the leadership of the CDC, including the public health leadership in Congress and in the White House. How's this been received so far? Well, we've just published this. We did, as we had near final versions of this paper, we shared it at many different corners of the executive branch at senior levels including, of course, the CDC leadership who needed to see it first and foremost uh, as a courtesy to them. And I want to say the CDC leadership, I want to commend them because their cooperation with us has been sterling. I mean, they've been very candid, very, very patient and very helpful all along the way in, in sharing with us their experiences. To your question of are we, who's, how's the response been? We parked it at all corners at senior levels within the executive, and we've begun dis dissemination in select places in Congress. We're going to be doing an aggressive outreach at the staff and member level within Congress in this next phase. We're going to be doing a special focus on the Georgia delegation. We're going to be talking to all others also. The Canadian uh, Public Health Authority is coming here next week, wants to talk about this reform effort. The Australians have reached out to us. The Chinese are interested in this. It's very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. And so we're going to be doing dialogues with all of those governments around this report. Now, the response that we've gotten so far from, I would say, across the board has been exceedingly positive. And what I mean by that is people have been reaching out privately, publicly, in coming to us and saying, you've done a great service in enumerating and unpacking what the problems are in a fair and balanced way without shying away from the gravity of the problem. And you've come up with, with reasonable and concrete solutions that are actionable. And that's a big service at this moment in time. And so I take that as people aren't coming to us and saying, well, you missed the boat on A, B, C, or D, or you're exaggerating the problem, or you're misreading the situation. Quite the opposite. It's been very, very affirmative across political divides. And keep in mind, I mean, we reached out and talked to several governors, folks that were high-level officials in the Trump administration, folks from all sorts of different walks, and we've Listen to them carefully. We've shared the document. They've allowed us to cite their, acknowledge the fact that they've spoken with us. We really went out of our way to listen and engage 
so that this is seen as a bipartisan, fair and balanced effort that is driven towards a, a sort of shared concern about the future of this institution that really is something that should appeal. The reset of CDC is something that should appeal to the better angels of all Americans, despite their political persuasion. Steve, it's a terrific report and a major accomplishment and a service to our country and hopefully other countries as well. Steve, thanks so much for being on Truth of the Matter. You can find the report at the CSIS website. And by the way, as of Thursday, January 19th, CSIS will have a new website. So we'll be sparkling on, uh, on, on that page. Steve, thanks so much. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts. From Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 